We have been looking at the life of Samson. And if you um, have been with us the last month, you know that we have started out from his birth. And if it was a bookmark, you would have to put his death. And today we're going to look at that. A life that was totally wasted at times. I thought about last night about how much Samson could have done in the short period of time that he was on earth as the judge of Israel, as their leader. But one thing that caused Samson so many problems was his eyes. He got distracted in life. And how many of you would admit without raising your hand, but just in your soul, that there's times in life that you get distracted? We get distracted because of how busy things are. We get busy at work. We get a bit busy when our children go back to school. We get busy with all the activities then the clubs we're in and all the politics and all the things that are happening in this world. We get busy and often distracted. But we need to keep our eyes focused on the one who is coming again. That's Jesus. Samson got his eyes distracted not on power. Power was not an issue for Samson. What the problem that Samson had, the issue that distracted him was lust. Three times Samson was distracted by women who he fell in love with to a degree, but actually that love was more of a lust. And each time that Samson got distracted away from the Lord, we see that some type of problem or destruction came and knocked on his door. Last week, if you were with us, you noticed that Samson, it says that he invited Delilah to come with him and, and, and they loved one another. She loved more the money that she was going to get to trick him, but he was in love with her. It was actually the one time out of the three women it says he was in love with her. And finally, we know that last week we saw in the scripture that Samson revealed how God gave him strength. It was through his hair. It was through that vow that had been taken even before his birth that his mother took. Samson had already broke all the parts of his vows as a Nazarite except for cutting his hair. He had already been around wine. He had already been around dead animals and touched that. He now has allowed her to cut his hair or have his hair cut. And he loses strength. And when he lost his strength, the Philistines that were hiding in the room, they came out and they attack him. And it takes us up to today as we look at Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16, starting in verse 21. Samson's hair has been cut. He has been weakened. And it says in verse 21, the Philistines seized him and they gouged out his eyes. Now understand what the Bible is telling us is that the problem that Samson had that was distracting him from the service of God, the Philistines took care of that problem for him. His problem was that his eyes focused on something other than Christ, other than God is what it was, was, was the incarnation, the coming of the Christ. And so the Philistines plucked them out. You know, I want to say this. The Philistines didn't realize what favor they were doing for Samson. I've heard of people that are addicted to certain things in life. You're addicted to your cell phones. The other night I went out to eat. My wife finally had a Friday night off. And so I took her out to eat. And, and it was kind of funny. I said, look at those teenagers over there. And they were sitting at the next table over, and there was two couples uh, that were there talking and eating. But the interesting thing is that they were not communicating with one another. All four of them had their cell phones out, texting and looking. And I said, could you imagine if we were on a date doing that? And I looked over at my wife, and she said, yeah, I, I can't imagine that. <laughs> and she put her phone down. <laughs> But I thought about, and I tease her about that, but I, I thought about how we can get distracted with things in life. The reason I even brought up the cell phone thing is because one of my friends had a cell phone. Actually, he didn't make the payment and it got turned off. And you would have thought that it was some kind of vital medicine he had to have. 
And I'll tell you this, it got him distracted from his faith and his prayer life and his time he spent with God. Cell phones are not bad, but they distract you. That's what happens, right? How many of you know that just being at home, I've seen on Facebook and on the computer, we get distracted. We spend more time with it than we do with our Bibles. We've all been guilty of that if you got internet. And then when the power goes out, what happens? We have a fit. I want to tell you today is that sometimes when we lose certain things in life, it might be for a benefit. You might get that later. But some things you lose in life, it might be for a benefit. Because here Samson lost the one thing that constantly caused him to be distracted from serving God as a judge of Israel. He lost his eyes. Was it painful? Yeah. Yeah. But in the end, it's what's going to help restore his strength. Now let's continue. It says that his eyes were gouged out and they brought him down to Gaza. Now Gaza was the place that before he went down and made fools out of the Philistines. Now they're going to repay that to him. He goes down to Gaza. He's bound with bronze shekels and was forced to grind grain in the prison. Verse 22 is a great verse. It says, But his hair began to grow back after it had been shaved. How many of you know that if you've ever seen someone that's had treatments for cancer or maybe they've shaved their head on purpose that your hair doesn't just grow back the next day. It takes time. It's a progress that it goes through. It goes through that little nibble stage where you can just barely feel it and then it, you can then you know that it's there. And here Samson, you can imagine, he doesn't see it, but Samson still has use of his hands. He can rub his head when he's out working and grinding the grain and he rubs the top of his head to wipe the sweat and he can feel that hair starting to grow back. And over time the people forgot what gave him strength. And then notice it says this, verse 23. Now the Philistine leaders gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to their god, Dagon. And if you've been with us on Wednesday nights, you've heard about the god Dagon before. It says that they go and they do this and they rejoice to their pagan god and they say, Our god has handed over our enemy, Samson, to us. Actually, it wasn't the god Dagon who handed over Samson. I will tell you who handed him over. God had lifted his presence off of Samson, and that's what allowed the enemy to attack Samson. You see, I believe that even America, that when we have turned our back on God, and God has gently lifted his hand off of us, that's what's allowed enemies to attack us. And here we see, it says in verse 24, When the people saw him, they praised their God and said, Our God has handed over to us our enemy who destroyed our land and who multiplied our dead. And when they were drunk, notice that this is a grand party that's going on. They have Samson out in the middle. It's during the time of the grain. So they're having that. Dagon is, is a symbol of the God who was part of the uh, harvest season. It says, they said, bring us Samson here to entertain us. This mighty man of strength has now become nothing more than a circus act. He is nothing more than a joke. He is falling in the ditch of sin. And now look at what happens. Is that God's enemies are mocking him. Do you know that when you backslide and that when you go and back into the world of sin, that the enemies of God, they love it. You've got to remain faithful and strong to the faith. Because if you don't, my friends, I'll tell you what it's going to do. It's going to give, it's going to give ammunition to those that are going to attack the church. You've got to remain faithful. How many of you know that you've seen people that have stepped away from God? And what does that do? That even brings reproach on the church. 
And it says that as they're drinking and they mock him and they want Samson to come to entertain them. It says, so they brought Samson from prison and he entertained them. Now, when I went and looked that up to figure out what exactly did Samson do? Did, did he stand there and tell jokes? Did he juggle? What did Samson do? Every commentary that I got my hands on said that what Samson did to entertain them is simply he stood there as they cast remarks and as they made fun of him. Look at Samson, the man who used to see all the beautiful women and now he cannot see anyone. Look at Samson who used to be able to break free and took that, the, the gate of the city and toted it for miles away and now he cannot even break the chains. That's how he entertained them, is that he became the butt of their jokes. And then it continues. It says that as he entertained them, they had him stand between the pillars. Verse 26. Samson said to the young man who was leading him by the hand, Lead me where I can feel the pillars supporting the temple, so I can lean against them. The temple was full of men and women. All the leaders of the Philistines were there. And about 3,000 men and women were on the roof watching Samson entertain them. The purpose of Samson's life was that he was to deliver God's people from the Philistines. He was to destroy them. He was the judge who was going to do that. And how many of you know that in the end we'll find out that Samson will fulfill his destiny? And then it says in verse 28, He called out to the Lord. How few times have we, since reading of the life of Samson, the son of Manoah, have we seen Samson call out on the Lord? Not many, huh? But now when he's at his lowest point, he's being laughed at, he's being mocked and ridiculed, he's blind, but yet something's happened. His hair has started to grow back and he has remembered God. How many of you know that no matter how far you have fallen from the faith, if you can remember God, that you can come home? I believe that's what's so powerful in the New Testament, the story of the prodigal son. It's why so many people enjoy reading that is because no matter how far you have fallen, you can return home, but you need to remember God. You need to remember God. It says that here it says that Samson did what? Samson goes and he's being led by this young boy. There's 3,000 people at least that are there watching him. And he calls out on the Lord. Why does he call out on the Lord? Because he knows that if you call on the Lord, the Lord will hear you. Psalm 61 verse 1 says, God, hear my cry and listen to my prayer. We need to know that God can hear you in the bed of a hospital room but God also can hear you when you're on your feet getting a promotion at work. You need to call on God not only when you're in the valley, but also on the mountaintop. Call out on God. And here he calls out on God. The song we sang just a few moments ago that call on God because he's on his throne. You remember singing that, I hope. But as you sang that song, it reminded me of listening to a sermon from Adrian Rogers, the great man of God from, that preached the gospel from Tennessee. And Adrian Rogers, who is now with the Lord, he said that while he was pastoring down in Florida, that this young girl came up to him and said, I love that song that we just sung. And, and it says, have faith in God, for he is on his throne. But she didn't say that. She said, have faith in God because he's on the telephone. <laughs> and Adrian Rogers looked at her and before he corrected her, he said, Shug, he said, you're exactly right. God is on the other line. You see, the little girl was getting it. When she was singing that song, Have Faith in God, for He is on His throne. She was singing, Have Faith in God, for He is on His telephone. And see, what she was thinking is God listening to us when we cry out on Him. When I heard Adrian Rogers tell that, I thought myself, sometimes kids get it when we don't. And then it says this, he calls out on the Lord and he says these words, Lord God, please remember me. That phrase, remember me, is simply the vows that were originally taken. 
strengthen me. God, just how? One more time. Samson knew this was the end. Samson knew that he would not have breakfast the next day. He knew that this was what it all led up to. And he calls on God, God, I have been a failure, but remember me just one more time. Just one more time, God, will you remember me? I've seen churches that have fallen from God, and if they would just pray out to God and say, God, remember us just one more time time that God can step in and revive a church, bring a church back to life. I've seen marriages falling apart and if they would just call out on the Lord and say, Lord, will you remember our marriage just one more time? What about your health? I can show you in the Bible time after time where people have called out on the Lord and have been healed. Just one more time. You know why we can call out on the Lord and ask Him to do it just one more time? Is because God is faithful, even to those who are not. I thank God for that. Just one more time. Don't you want to see the don't you want to see the move of God in Atkinson Baptist just one more time? Where, where the baptism pool is full, where lives are being changed, where the altar has people coming to ask Jesus to, to forgive them or to draw closer to Him, where sins have been confessed, where lives have been transformed, where just one more time that people, when they drive through this town, they say, there's a reason to stop in this sleepy little town. And the reason is because God's moving one more time. Time. I'm looking forward to the time of that. And I believe God's in the midst of doing that, my friends. And He's using you. He's using the people of God that have been faithful to Him. He's using the people of God that maybe have left and now come back. He's using each and every one of us. And we must return to God. Let's do it one more time. And here it says that he calls out and asks God to give him strength one more time. Why? Because finally Samson understands his strength did not come from his inner self. It was not about him. It was all about God. It says, with one act of vengeance, let me pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. Still Samson has revenge on his tongue. Why? Because Samson's human. You've been done wrong, haven't you? Every one of you in here has been done wrong. And you've got revenge sometimes in your mind. When I lived in Wallace, one of the memories that I still have today of being done wrong is when I was only seven years old. I remember as if it were yesterday having a blue huffy bicycle. It had Carolina blue tires. I loved that bicycle so much. I'd ride that bicycle every day I get a chance. Well, then my neighbor who was in high school knew how much I loved that bicycle. He went and took out his brand new pocket knife and he cut both my tires. And I can remember at seven years old that I knew I couldn't beat that boy. But if I could, I would have. But I remember taking my bike because I was there visiting his brother and we were out playing. And when I came out and found my bike like that, he had took and cut the tires and then spray painted where he had cut them. And I got on the bike. I still remember that you just couldn't ride because the tires had been slashed. And as I pushed that bike about a block to my grandma's house where I lived at the time, I just cried. Because I was that upset. And for years. Every time I saw a bicycle that was made by Huffy, I would have a bad experience because I thought about what that boy had done to me. And to this day, I still think about it. Now, have I forgiven him? Yes, I'm over it. But is there, is there still a bad taste in my mouth? Yes. Would I love to have my blue Carolina blue tires on my Huffy? I'd love to have it. But I'm going to tell you this, is that I'm human. It's human to still be upset. Samson, when you read this, Samson, as he's calling out on God, notice what's he, he's still not perfect. 
My friends, God does not wait for you to become perfect to redeem you, to forgive you. God's not waiting for perfection. God wants you to come just as you are so He can mold you and make you what you need to be. It's as if someone says, let me go run and take a shower, Pastor, so I'll be clean enough to take a bath. How foolish! It is as if we say, when I'm good enough to come to church, then I'll come. You're never going to be good enough. I will never be good enough to stand behind this pulpit. You'll never be good enough. But you can be redeemed and forgiven. And here we see, and I know my time is slowly slipping away, but give me just a few more moments. It says that Samson calls out, and even in that, you notice he still wants revenge. It says that, let me do this. Verse 30. Verse 29, Samson took to hold of the middle pillar supporting the temple and they leaned against them, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might and the temple fell on the leaders and all the people in it. And the dead he killed at his death were more than those he had killed his entire life. And then his brothers and his father's family came down. They carried him back and they buried him between Zorah and Etheron and the temple or in the tomb of his father Menorah. And so he judged Israel 20 years. Some life, isn't it? This man has so much potential. And he did. And at the very end, I mean, he still is known as one of the great men of faith. You say, Pastor Ken, I, I don't know about all of that. Well, I do because if you read... The book of Hebrews, you remember there's a chapter in there called the Hall of Faith. Guess one of the names that's mentioned in there is Samson. And one day whenever you walk on the streets of gold, you're going to bump into a man with a little bit longer hair than I have. And probably more muscles than I have. And when you bump into him, you're going to say, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm that guy, I'm Samson. He made it to heaven, I believe, because why? He called out on God. I've had some debate men say, well, Pastor Ken, didn't he commit suicide? And isn't suicide then forgivable sin? No, show me in the Bible where it says that. You know, I used to struggle with that with a young, as a young man. And I understand this, that suicide is, yes, it's murder to yourself. But do you know God forgives all sins? I'm very quick not to judge someone else, aren't you? You don't know what someone else is going through their mind, what's happened. But I want to say this to you in the last verse I want to read to you. is Isaiah 40, 29 through 31. It's the last text and our time has expired. God gives strength to the weary. I thank God for that because there's days that I'm weary, aren't you? God gives strength to you. The weary. He strengthens the powerless. Means that when you feel like you have no standing, whenever you feel like you're just a small country church, you know, in the eyes of God, where two or three are gathered together, it's just as powerful a revival than when two or three thousand or two or three million are together. I mean, it doesn't require a big number to impress God. What impresses God is our devotion and faith and attention to Him. A video I just watched earlier this week, and I'm going to post a video of my own to have a response to it. But this popular TV preacher's wife got up and was saying that all that we do in our worship is not for God, but for ourselves. And I watched that, and I was like, how foolish, because what we do is not for ourselves, it's for God. You see, God is what strengthens us. God's what gives us power. And then it continues in the text, it says, youth may faint... And they may grow weary, and young men may stumble and fall. But those, listen, those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. And they will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not grow faint. Restoration takes time, friends. And we need to be understanding the people that are in the process of being restored.
Today I close this out asking you this. How did you start your race when you got saved? Are you still just as vibrant? Are you still just as eager to come to church and pray and love? Are you at that now? Some of you are near the end of your race simply because of the time that is ticking on your eternal clock. Some of you are at that, at that point. Some of you are at the point that you know for a fact that that's happening. Don't you? You know that it's fine. I mean, you look in the mirror and you know that you're not as young as you used to be. And you know time is ticking. In fact, I was visiting someone this week and they told me they went to the funeral home and they were making their arrangements and they said that, you know, they were asked, well, who's going to preach your funeral? And they said, well, I hope that's a long time from now, but I, I want Pastor Ken to preach my funeral. And I said, well, you've put a big burden on me, but I'll be more than glad to do that. But what she was saying is that I know time's short, but even if it's not, I want you to still participate in it. She was making arrangements. Are you? Now today, there's some of you, you got your minds on all different things. I know that. I'm not foolish. But is your mind on Jesus? We're, I want everyone to bow their head and we're about to pray. Let's just bow our heads to prayer. With every head bow and every eye closed, and as we prepare to sing this time of invitation, in 1 Corinthians it says that if you're to take communion, that you are to examine yourself and not take part of the Lord's table unworthy. It doesn't say the pastor examines you, but it doesn't say a deacon examines you. You examine yourself. Why? Because you know where you stand with God. Samson knew exactly where he stood with God. And in the end, that's why he had to call out on God to strengthen him one more time. Friends, where do you stand with your wife? Where do you stand with your children? Where do you stand as being a godly woman or a godly man in your community? Where do you stand with God? I don't know. I can perceive. I don't know. But you know exactly where you stand with God. Examine yourself before you take part of this. Confess the sins to Jesus and He will forgive you. He will strengthen you just one more time. Because who knows, today might be the last day you take this communion. You might say, Pastor, that sounds fatalistic. No, it's simply stating this, that no man or woman or child in this room is promised tomorrow. And so knowing that today, will you search yourself and will you let Jesus Christ do the work that only He can do? Today is the day of salvation, friends. If you need to be saved, the altar's open or rededicate or join this church, whatever it is, today is that day. Just one more time. Can you do it? I know God can. Amen.